ordered the December 14, 2020 workshop. It's now 6-10-32. Apologize for the late start. Mr. Devon, it looks like we need to do a roll call. Mayor Williams? Here. Here. Mayor for a 10 Miller? Here. Council Member Piker? Here. Council Member Ford? Here. Council Member Jones? Here. Council Member Marriott? Here. Council Member Simpson? Here. Mr. Devon, you've got one workshop item on the agenda tonight. Yes, we do, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. We're pleased to present to you a update on our water infrastructure master plan. This was a strategic result uh, that you set in your strategic plan. This is an update. We're making progress on that. Uh, and we have a team of uh, 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 employees and uh, consultants who have been working on this that you'll hear from uh, them tonight. And we're going to start with Director of Utilities, Sharon Israel, with, uh, who will start the presentation. Very good. Good evening, Ms. Israel. Ah, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of council. It's a pleasure, as always, to be here. Um, I, um, I, you know, I, you may recall I was hired here in this position uh, about a year and a half ago. And um, I just am very excited to be presenting this to you this evening. It is an update on our water master planning efforts. Um, this is definitely something I'd like to geek out on, and I'm really, I'm, I've been looking forward to this evening for, for a while now. Um, I also, because I am a longtime resident of Arvada, so I call Arvada home, and I've lived here for over 15 years now. So I think what you're going to hear from me tonight is just a lot of passion and excitement, in part, too, because this is, this is my community like it is yours. Um, Kind of to set the stage for tonight, um, I'd like to encourage you all to ask questions as we go. Um, I'll be presenting some of the slides and, and information this evening, and I'll be accompanied by uh, Jacqueline Rhodes, who's our city engineer. And then we also have Chad Seidel online, and Chad is with Corona Environmental Consultants, and they uh, were the consulting firm for our water treatment master plan. So you're gonna hear from a couple of really great subject matter experts tonight. Um, so please, uh, Josie, next slide. So here's a review of the agenda. Uh, I'm gonna provide some background information, get us all grounded in where we're coming from, heading into these master plans, the strategic alignment with the city, uh, city council approved strategic plan, and some uh, philosophical um, approaches that we took as we were entering into this master planning work. I'll give you a, a quick background of our history, and then uh, Chad will take over and he will talk about the water treatment master plan, the approach that we took, and some of the highlights and key issues that were identified. Um, then Jacqueline is going to step in and she is going to take over the water distribution master plan piece. And, uh, and similar to Chad, go through our process and, and some key findings from that work. And then I'll be stepping in again with the assessment of the master plan findings. And you all should have a hard copy of the handout that was in your packet. Um, it is a, it's a one pager and it is small type, I know, but it, it was an attempt to be as comprehensive as possible as a quick reference for you. So we'll be talking about overall findings and, um, and next steps going forward um, and how we, we plan to, to do our, our forward implementation. Um, one of the things we, we're not gonna go into detail tonight on are the, uh, are the funding options and financial plans that still need to be assessed and put in place in order for us to complete the implementation of these master plans. Uh, so we're going to focus a lot on the, the technical work tonight and then ask for, um, at, you know, if you've got questions as we go along, if there's any additional information that you'd like us to research or look into as we uh, go forward in the year ahead with digging into some financial planning. Um, so are there any questions to start? I don't see any. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, actually, Sharon, I do have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, in 
in our summarization of this workshop, it said even on page two, it said even with a normal summer season next year, capacity limitations may require implementation of watering restrictions, especially in the western areas of the city. And I wanted to know why the western area in particular. So um, one of the one of the key topics we're talking about tonight is the additional capacity we need to be able to serve the demand in the city. So uh, Council Member Ford, I will give you a short answer now and then we will be digging into that in more detail a little later in the presentation. Uh, but okay, the short, that, the, the short yes, the short answer is that we um, we experienced a higher than expected peak day demand this past summer. That is because of hot weather. And then also we have had um, a rapid pace of planned growth in the northwest part of the city. And during those very high peaks, we challenged our distribution system to be able to meet that demand. And, uh, and it resulted in some relatively minor damage, but some damage to one of our pump stations that serves that area. And so heading into the next summer, um, we are gonna be a lot more tuned into that. Um, in part because of the master planning and work that we're doing right now. Um, and then also just kind of having learned, uh, learned a bit more about how that, um, how those really high peak days impact our system out there. So again, that's oh. the short, short answer. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something different about the Western part of the city, you know, whether it was usage or something like that, that was, Okay, thanks. Okay, you're welcome. And, okay, if there are no more questions, we'll, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Thank you, Josie. So I'll be talking now uh, some background on how we kind of got to this master plan work today and our grounding in uh, strategic planning and philosophy. So next slide, please. So the work you're hearing about this evening is a culmination of several years of work with our internal team, our external consultants, um, especially in the last six months, we've had a series of five internal workshops with members of our leadership team and the city manager's office and Brian Archer, our finance director. Um, we have put a lot into thinking about what we want the future of Arvada's water to look like. And one of our exercises, I'm sharing with you the results here, is a word cloud. And we all, during one of our internal workshops, thought about, well, how do we, how do we imagine water, Arvada's water future, and, and what words would we put to that? It won't surprise you to see. Safe and reliable and affordable and plentiful and high quality, secure is in there. And so these are all words I, I, I think would resonate with, with anyone you talked to when you talked about water supply. And, and we certainly reflected on these types of words as values as we, uh, was, as we contemplated the results of our consultants' findings and then came to an agreement on what our, our, our recommended course of action is that we're presenting to you tonight. Next slide, please. So as Mark mentioned in the introduction, um, the results we're speaking to you about this evening are part of the City Council's strategic plan and the direction that Council has given to the infrastructure work system to update master plans for water and wastewater and stormwater. Um, and we have been working on that with a deadline of next December, December of 2021, to have master plans complete in all three of those utility areas. The focus tonight is on water. We will be returning to you at later dates with the results and findings from those other master plans as they're currently in development. Um, but specifically through the water lens, we have some principles that are, are 
stated in our in our strategic plan. And one of them includes maintaining utility rates at the lowest practical levels so we can support replacement of aging infrastructure and maintain robust systems. So some of what you'll hear about tonight is that replacement of aging infrastructure, that reinvestment need we have. Um, another of the principles is about providing the community with a safe and reliable and high quality water supply for full city build out as defined by the comprehensive plan. And that is also um, the guidelines that we used as we were developing our master plans is thinking ahead to what has been contemplated as a, as a need for, um, for that vision of the future. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Josie, next slide, please. Thank you. So you're going to hear us talk about reinvestment and you're going to hear us talk about capacity. And um, you may recall in my previous presentations about the budget this year, um, this is an important distinction for us to make in part because our, our, our philosophy on how we pay for these types of projects. So a reinvestment project, for example, philosophically, we pay for that from user fees and rates. So this is kind of spread across the city and it is about reinvesting in our current infrastructure um, at our current capacity and level of service. Um, we also have projects you're gonna hear about tonight that are about increasing capacity. So that's about being able to serve more demand as a result of the planned growth that we have for the city. And for those types of projects, we philosophically look at things like tap fees or occasionally um, uh, contributions from developers to be able to pay for those increased capacity projects. So some photos that you see here on the screen at the upper left, that's a group of us standing at the spillway of Gross Reservoir. And that's a good example of, of a, a fully capacity related project. So that is an expansion that we need so that we can continue to develop water supply and meet the future needs of the city. Um, in the lower right hand corner, you can see there's some damage to concrete staircase that's over at our Ralston water treatment plant. That's a reinvestment need, not necessarily treatment related, but facility related. It's about infrastructure um, that needs to be, um, it's just at the end of its life. Um, the, the photo at the bottom center is a picture of our reaction tank at the Ralston water treatment plant. And you can see that there's some rust starting to form um, along the edges of that, uh, that weir where water spills over. And, and um, that's the kind of thing we need to, to do to, um, to reinvest in that type of uh, infrastructure. We need to drain the tank. We need to put a new coating on it. Um, sometimes we have to do structural repair on, on facilities like this. Um, so that's a good, another good example of reinvestment. It doesn't increase our capacity. It just, it's something that needs care. And then on the lower left corner is a, a, one of our filter beds. And that's just like an example of a project where it's both reinvestment and increasing capacity. So the, our filter beds, um, it is time to rebuild all of our filter beds. The benchmark um, uh, time frame to rebuild filter beds is about 10 years. You're going to hear from Chad a little bit more about that um, and those needs. And um, and some of our filter beds haven't been been built in a lot longer, rebuilt in a lot longer than that, maybe even as long as 30 years. So we've got some reinvestment we need to do to rebuild the structure of the material in those filters. But at the same time, using innovations in technology and materials, we can also increase the capacity of treatment in that same footprint. So if we were to go and do a reinvestment and capacity project in the same filter bed, um, that's an example of where, you know, if they're sort of cross, um, both purposes served by that project. Next slide, please. So you know why we do this. We do this to work so that everyone in Arvada, businesses and residences can, residents can, can count on being able to turn the tap on in their kitchen or 
wherever they are and they know the water is safe to drink. That is the most important function that we have. That's about public health. That's about meeting the community's expectations. That's well-being. Um, there's also other considerations that we have to um, uh, put into our equations as we're thinking about where our priorities are. And big one is fire flow. So we also size our water mains, make sure that when our Vata Fire Protection District trucks pull up to our hydrants, that there's enough capacity in our pipes and our storage tanks and our pump stations to be able to meet the demand immediately at any time of day or night for extremely high flows for firefighting. Um, we also, uh, in the upper left corner there, there's a couple of our guys working on a line break. And, um, and so we also do this so that we can maintain a certain level of service. And that meets that, um, that is something our, our, I think our citizens have come to expect from us. We have a very low level of line breaks in the city. Um, we're a fraction of what the benchmark is uh, national, nationally. Um, but that's in part because we do reinvestment in our water lines before they break. Um, but that's part of what's, what we're talking about today. And then um, uh, the lower left corner uh, is that picture of, of irrigating a beautiful lawn. And that is something that is desirable for many of our residents and businesses. And um, that picture depicts what, what we call our peak day or peak hour demand. So not only do we not have do we have to have enough water supply sort of on an average basis on an average year? Um, we have to have enough treatment capacity, but we also need enough storage capacity and, and large enough lines to be able to meet that peak demand when like everybody's turning on their sprinklers on the hottest day of July. Um, next slide, please. So this is the why, right? On the reinvestment side, it's it's about our public health, it's about water quality, it's about resiliency, reliability. This is all everything our current um, level of service um, is at today, and we want to keep it that way. We want to be able to meet peak demand without watering restrictions. And and I'm talking here aside from a drought condition, of course. So a drought condition is something we'd all have to you know regionally deal with together. But we don't want to have to do a watering restriction just because we don't have a large enough pump station, for example. And Council Member Ford, that speaks a bit to your question earlier about some of the challenges we're having right now. We, of course, need to make sure we have enough uh, capacity for fire flow and continue to maintain that. And then last but not least is around regulatory compliance. So every day we, ha we take we take many, many measurements at the treatment plant. Every month we take hundreds of measurements of water quality. And, and all of that is so we can comply with the Safe Drinking Water Act and then also um, the state primary drinking water regulations here in Colorado. We do all that with our rein the reinvestment in mind. Then of course, capacity in mind, right? We have, we, we want to provide service for the planned development as, um, as contemplated in the comprehensive plan. Um, we want to meet that peak demand again without watering restrictions for all of our new customers. Um, we we want to make sure that we're we're pacing the additional uh, planned development um, at the right pace alongside the the pace of building infrastructure to meet the demands. I, I use the term component failures in understanding that we did have that situation this past summer. Um, where we did not have enough infrastructure capacity to meet demand. And then, of course, fire protection as well. And um, especially as we move toward the west um, and we go up in elevation, we're having some very interesting um, conversations with developers about how to provide fire protection at the, at the flow rates that are needed up. So next slide. So here's some history. Um, because I think it's important to understand the types of reinvestments we've we've done and focused on the last couple of decades. Um, so it, it can paint a picture for you about how we're we're looking ahead to the future. So next slide, please. Here is a 
um, a schematic of our overall water system. And I hope this helps frame for you tonight the, the scope of the master planning work that you're gonna be hearing more about. Um, we have, of course, our Vada Reservoir. We've got two water treatment plants. One was built in 1960, the other in 1984. Um, we've got a set of 10 storage tanks around the city. Um, they date from 1950s to the present. Um, we've got seven pump stations and we have 12 pressure zones. And pressure zones are really interesting because they require us to have kind of breaks in between pressure zones because we have such a high, um, such a significant change in elevation from the lowest part of the city to the highest part of the city. And it just adds a certain level of complexity to our system that you wouldn't see, for example, you know, east out in the plains where you don't have that same type of elevation change. Next slide, please. So here's some pictures of some of our upgrades over the years. Um, I love that picture in the upper left. That is from um, around 1960 when we were building the Ralston water treatment plant for the first time. And you can see that ah, there's just nothing around out there, is it? Is there? Um, if you drive out, it's drive out 64th right now, it's almost to Highway 93 and um, it looks like a whole different place. Um, so over the years, we have done additions. Um, we have in the lower center picture, we built a second water treatment plant. That's our Arvada plant. We, we run it as a peaking plant, just part of the year. Um, and we've done, you know, component improvements as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, so I would say over the last 20 years, if you want to look at you know, the, the, from 2000 to 2010, um, we were really driven by changes in regulations. There were some significant changes at the national level on the, the level of treatment we had to provide as a, a public water system and the types of surface water treatment we provide. So in that decade, we added um, additional treatment processes to the Ralston plant. We did a major upgrade to the Arvada plant. And then we also started adding some of these pump stations on the west side that we knew we were gonna need to begin to serve the planned and contemplated uh, development in the Northwest. Over the last 10 years, um, as, as this will not surprise you. Our priority has really been on water supply development. And that's their focus on the gross reservoir expansion. Um, and let me speak to that uh, for a moment because that, that is truly an exceptional achievement for the city of Arvada. For us to be able to say that we have secured our water supply with the development of gross reservoir is it puts us in an enviable position compared to any of our neighbors. It is a, um, it's a true achievement for the city to have thought, you know, 10, 20 years ago that this is something that we needed to do and then to have gotten as far as we did with um, actually getting the financing in order, uh, formalizing our agreement with Denver Water, who's just an excellent partner and really building our capabilities to bring the supply in that we need. We could not, it would be extremely difficult to, to find that amount of water on today's market. So our timing was really good on that. Um, we also, in the last 10 years, um, have put in additional pump stations, an additional tank. Um, some of this has been in concert with our development partners, like in the Leiden Rock area, um, the Ranson tank is our furthest tank up the hill that uh, serves, um, again, the plan development in the Northwest. So that's really been our priority. Um, and so the way I look at it now is that what we're doing next, and, and as council is directed to do us to do in these master plans, is to think about, okay, we've got our water supply secured. We we know that there are some reinvestment needs. Let's get our arms around those. Let's talk about them and let's figure out how we're gonna spend the next 10 to 20 years in terms of reinvesting and then also building the capacity we need to uh, 
uh, support the comprehensive plan. So that concludes my introduction. Um, I'll pause here and, um, and ask if there are any questions um, before I hand it off to Chad Seidel. Okay. I see no Thank questions. You. Ms. Ford, did you have any questions before I move on? Um, not really, but you know, um, Sharon, I was wondering on your uh, Arvada's water system, were these tanks of a certain size? Because don't we have a tank on uh, Sims? Um, we do have a tank on Sims. Um, we have, well, we've got tanks throughout the city. Um, they, they're designed for different, um, so sort of with some different design parameters depending on what exactly we need them for. Mm -hmm. um, and I am going to let Jacqueline Rhodes answer that question in a little bit more detail in her presentation. Um, she'll be speaking to the tanks. And I'm sorry, Sharon, because I just noticed it is on this list. When I first looked at it, I didn't see it. And uh, so now I see where it is. Yeah. It, it's interesting. If, if, if you didn't know it was there, you would just think it's sort of a strange hill with a tennis court on top. Right. And um, that strange hill is actually a, a major component of our water system right there in the, in the city. Um, let me also um, take a moment, I, I was remiss in not mentioning this earlier, um, in addition to the speakers that we have lined up to present to you tonight, um, we also have our water operations manager, Chris Campman, on the line, and we have Brad Wyant, who is our water treatment manager, on the line, and we don't have them queued up to, uh, to make any formal presentation. Um, but they have some really tremendous experience and we might be calling on them to answer any specific questions you might have. Okay. Well, with that, um, let's, uh, let's, I'll, I'll let Chad take it away. Chad, why don't you introduce yourself and, and Chad's gonna talk about the water treatment master plan. Terrific, thank you, Sharon. And thanks for allowing me the chance to connect with you all. Appreciate the opportunity to be connected virtually yet still communicate the information that's uh, important to you all. Chelsea, why don't we step into the next slide? I am here to describe the efforts with respect to the Water Treatment Master Plan, which uh, myself and other colleagues at Corona Environmental Consulting have addressed over the last uh, few years. Uh, resulting in some key deliverables that help shape the understanding of the condition of the current assets and the expected needs to meet condition into the future, as well as the, the treatment capacity needs. So the next slide will give us a, a quick setting of the parameters of the guiding principles for that, really aligned with the comprehensive plan with the expectations of 30% population growth for the course of the next 20 years. and a need for an additional 25% additional treatment capacity with the ideal to have that in place within the next 10 years. So the scope of the analysis is focused on the reinvestment needs to address end of life of infrastructure and then improvements necessary to meet the growing uh, demand. So how much water uh, does the city need to be able to treat and supply to meet those, uh, those distribution system needs. Next slide. couple of great photos to give you some examples. On the left hand side, you have a photo from the Ralston Water Treatment Plant, the process of extracting uh, the fluoride chemical tank, which uh, had had a leak and required replacement. Uh, this is a important chemical for the water treatment plant process and needing to replace that was important to meet the operational expectations. On the right happens to be the influent channel or the flume that really uh, it, it was a critical detail for the infrastructure that needed to be addressed as soon as possible and so that's already been uh, moved forward and so those examples can help you have an appreciation for the the condition of the assets that you have for your water treatment supply system and give you a little bit more details we step to the next slide which talks about the scope of the treatment facilities master plan you know, we, we focused on a number of key things to help inform the city's understanding of what you have and what you need to have going into the future. 
certainly the regulatory expectations got to be in compliance with things, not only just for the, the legal expectations, but the fact that your, your community expects that. We looked at everything on a unit process basis. So from how water comes in to the system and how it's treated and how it leaves and then hand that off to what will be talked about later for the distribution system. We looked at condition assessment. We looked at some of the hydraulic aspects of things of so how fast water could be moved through those components to consider if it could be increased to provide more supply with the existing assets. Uh, we looked at different ways to expand to meet future treatment capacity needs and made some recommended improvements. We did provide cost estimates for the more pressing priorities. Uh, but it's important to note that we didn't include the phased cost of all the different various improvements that could be made. And so it's important to note that some of the things that we'll talk about here is the fact that there are some things that need to be fixed with the existing infrastructure. There are some needs to be met to increase the treatment capacity and how that is phased will help uh, achieve those goals with some different outcomes of do you have to fix some things today that will be replaced in the short term thereafter or can we optimize around that to achieve everything as best uh, with one one process. So on the next slide you'll get a sense of uh, the fact that your system is really well managed and, and it's important to note that it's really skillfully operated to maintain compliance. You know I, I get the chance to work with water utilities around the state, around the country, we get called in in places where there's really significant concerns. I really love working with the city and the staff because they're proactive. They are on top of uh, the best ways to operate their systems. And so they are achieving and exceeding uh, the regulatory compliance objectives and maintaining water supply expectations for customers, addressing key expectations with respect to turbidity or the particles that are in the water maintaining disinfection. Those first two things are really the fundamentals of public health protection and drinking water supply. There's more specific details into the, the underlying uh, science of water treatment and public health protection, things like total organic carbon removal and the corresponding disinfection byproducts. We ought to maintain corrosion control so we don't have corrosion byproducts into the water that's supplied to customers. And manganese is another uh, inorganic contaminant that can cause some aesthetic concerns and also has concerns for distribution system conditions downstream. But staff doing a great job, even in challenging conditions uh, with variations in water supply, whether it be drought conditions or, or uh, high water supply conditions, the, the staff are doing a great job running things. But if we step to the next slide, you'll get a sense of the improvements uh, that may be needed going forward. So we needed to frame the expectations for the future because any conditions that you uh, improve upon today or expansion to meet future treatment capacity needs, you want those to live for decades to uh, meet the expectations of those investments. So there are some key regulatory conditions that aren't in place today, but we can reasonably expect to be in place in the lifetime of these assets going forward. One is regarding lead and copper. Lead and copper rule revisions are expected to come out uh, at the federal level any day now. This has been the case for several months. Certainly could expect it to come out this year or, or early next calendar year. And so the city's already been proactive in doing some testing with lead and copper coupons, as you see in the photo on the top right there. We considered those implications in this uh, regulatory requirements assessment. Another that's important uh, that doesn't currently have really stringent regulatory requirements, but there's some important guidance is around the issue of cyanotoxins and harmful algal blooms. You'll note in the photos on the bottom right there from a colleague of ours at the city of Loveland, where we addressed some concerns they had in their green uh, Ridge Glade Reservoir, where algae had become problematic to the point at which not only was it causing taste and odor concerns, but it could also be of concern for uh, cyanotoxins. So how to address that. And then on down the list here, you'll note some other water relevant contaminants of concern perfluorinated compounds, often by the acronym PFAS, Legionella, perchlorate, chlorite and chlorate, and then nitrosamines. All these things can be of concern for future regulatory issues. And we took those into account to make sure that the city's prepared and ready to address those. And frankly, not, uh, not be surprised by those if and when those are realized. Next slide. We also specifically considered the Arvada Reservoir. 
it's a central component to the uh, water supply and water treatment system needed to understand its current conditions and how uh, impacts in missing, mixing supplies into that source could be of concern. That could cause changes and, and raise questions about these contaminants that are listed here, ranging from manganese to uh, aluminum, certainly nutrients and turbidity that we talked about that can influence taste and odor. So that was addressed as well. Next slide. This photo is intended to illustrate how we went step by step through the process, looking at components that are critical to the water treatment supply, both at the Ralston water treatment plant and at the Arvada water treatment plant. And we noted key details where there were either physical condition uh, concerns or even just functional concerns with some of the attributes about some of the way the equipment might operate. So for example, you might have uh, electrical systems that need to be improved upon uh, and, and you might not see it at the surface, but we know it because of some of the underlying conditions. Next slide. So I wanted to just frame, rather than put a slide that shows all of the details, we framed the condition assessment needs based upon their unit criticality and condition. And we put them into bins of immediate needs to be addressed within three to five years, midterm needs on the three to five year, uh, zero to three years for the first, midterm from three to five years, long-term five to 10. And then we lumped some in this last category of, it really depends when my, we improve upon these things for condition assessment based upon meeting the future supply needs. And so you'll note in the columns for the Ralston plant and the Arvada plant, there are condition assessment needs spread across those range of conditions. So for example, if future supply or future treatment capacity needs to be addressed um, at one location versus another, there might be some of those longer term needs that would get addressed at the same time we're doing things to improve upon the treatment capacity. Uh, all these details are available in the underlying materials and we can speak to those as you wish, but gives you a sense that we wanna do what is best to uh, take hold of the opportunity to make these improvements uh, one time. Next slide. So the treatment capacity needs were established with a goal to increase the current treatment capacity of 52 million gallons of water treatment capacity per day by 12 million gallons per day to have a ultimate capacity of 64 million gallons a day treatment capacity within the next 10 years. So that is uh, to be added upon based upon the, the current 36 million gallons of water that can be produced per day at the Ralston plant or 16 million gallons per day that can be treated at the Arvada plant. And you have to be able to have that water to put through the treatment plant in the first place. And then the treatment plant itself has to be able to process that much water. So if we go to the next slide, I'll step you through how we thought about this. We considered alternatives to achieve those treatment capacity needs. First, by simply expanding the Ralston plant. Could we add that 12 additional million gallons of water treatment capacity at that facility? Next is, could we just expand the existing Arvada plant by 12 MGD? Could we split the difference between the two, anywhere from zero to 12 MGD? And then the last would be perhaps to just completely build a new facility to replace the Arvada plant. And these all made sense at the time, and, and we, I'll demonstrate a little bit more detail about them because of some of those condition assessment expectations, as well as other constraints, physical land availability, footprint constraints, hydraulic constraints, and uh, the best ways to leverage this uh, stage of improvements. The next slide will step into describing this for the Ralston plant. We went through a very detailed hydraulic analysis to discern on a unit by unit basis how much water could be pushed through these various components at the existing treatment facility. So while the existing treatment plant has a nameplate treatment capacity of 36 million gallons of water treated per day, it is reasonable to expect we could make some improvements to it to achieve 40 million gallons of water treated per day with just some limited improvements to the existing infrastructure. It's a really good way to make the best use of those assets. Now, we can't go beyond that to 44 or 48 MGD because of some pretty significant hydraulic constraints, which will require replacement and upsizing of pipes and other critical piece, pieces of the treatment process, which would in effect render the rest of the facility needing to be replaced in the entirety. So it helps set the stage for how far we can go without going beyond that. Next slide. 
the Arvada plant, on the other hand, had some more uh, significant condition assessment details to be addressed, as well as the fact that it has a bit more space available. And here's one of the several examples that we considered to expand upon the Arvada plant to achieve the additional treatment capacity. And we can take that existing facility at 16 MGD to 28 million gallons of water treated per day by using some more uh, advanced water treatment processes for pretreatment, uh, a bit more space efficiency on the filtration process. We can repurpose some of the existing facilities and use some of the existing facilities that are already in great shape to just use in their current phase uh, to achieve that expansion at that point. So we can do that on that side as well. Next slide. So tying these things together, we have to apply, well, so what's the goal? We need to expand by uh, 12 million gallons of water treated per day within the next 10 years. We have to do it in some way, shape or form between Ralston, which we can take up by four MGD, but then we got to either expand our data or replace our data. And that then sets the stage for, well, how do you do that? There are some upfront testing requirements, not only to inform the design process, but also to meet regulatory expectations. Then you go through the detailed design process, permitting and building. The top example shows how you could get started with both of those things at the existing facilities and likely be done you know, on the order of six or seven years. The lower example shows if you were to move the Arvada facility to another location, might take a little bit more time because you got to identify the location and some of the details of where to move the water. But generally speaking, these goals are still readily achievable. From a cost, we didn't get into all the details about cost. It's just worth noting that you know, estimated costs of, of a 28 MGD new facility or replacement facility for the Alvada plant, it's on the order of $90 million. And there are other aspects that may be worth incorporating at this time, given current and future expectations for water quality and public health protection, disinfection with ozone or UV disinfection, and then practical aspects to make sure that the process is efficient for staff, you know, whether it be offices or control room or laboratory and maintenance. So those things are accounted for and those decisions need to be framed in the next steps that will move forward. So next slide. Just wanted to use this as the handoff time. Is this, as the water is leaving the water treatment plants, it goes to the water distribution system where those things have to be synced up to be able to receive the newer increased water supply uh, from water supply through water treatment to water distribution to get to the customers. So we'll have that uh, transition next. And happy to answer questions now and, and later. Ms. Ford, do you have any questions at this time? I do not, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I see nothing else from the rest of council. Well, thank you, Chad. I'll go ahead and pick up and, and deliver some takeaways from the water distribution master plan effort. And in the next slide, I just wanted to kick it off with um, acknowledging that similar to the, how our treatment facilities are maintained, you know, our water distribution system is well maintained, well operated to maintain public health and compliance. Um, you know, before joining the city, I, my background um, was working in water, water quality, water treatment, um, water distribution. And so it was exciting to be a part of this team that you see here today as, as we look to program out the next phase of infrastructure improvements that are needed to maintain this level of service that um, our citizens have, have grown to expect. Um, so some examples are shown here, a uh, performance measure um, for us, uh, water main breaks and response times. Those are very low relative to industry benchmarks. Um, and I think a lot of that has to do with our active use of our city works and our asset management program that allows us to be really proactive in our maintenance. And you'll hear more recommendations around this later in the, in the presentation. Um, we have a team that's really passionate about autom automation and control improvements. And again, this just allows us to maintain um, a pulse on, on the health of our system and the way that we're delivering water. And of course, distribution system water quality. It's really important not to just maintain our disinfectant residual, um, our, our pressure, but you know we know we have other water quality constituents that have to be monitored and maintained um, to, to have delicious tasting water at the tap. So in the next slide, I wanted to just, after that introduction, talk a little bit about the master plan scope itself. Um, so one of the, the 
fundamental aspects of, of this effort was to generate our first hydraulic model that simulates our, our water distribution system. And so this took a significant amount of effort to utilize our GIS data and our asset um, inventory and calibrate this system model to represent our, our system operations. So within that, we look at our current water demand and we also project out future demand at different planning horizon, horizons and then look at recommended improvements. Um, so some things that we were not a part of this initial effort included um, how we use that water model. So we know that we can look at a steady state model and different snapshots in time as to what our system looks like under different scenarios that we might choose to evaluate. But in extended period simulation, we really take that further and we look at some uh, stressors to the system over a course of a few days and, and see how our tanks respond and how we're able to achieve system pressures and, and maintain those. Other things that were not done, um, a condition assessment. You heard Chad talk about some of the data we were able to collect in the treatment um, master plan that really looked at the condition of our assets and calculated remaining useful life and what's the risk of failure of those assets. That wasn't done here. Um, and water supply projections. Uh, we're secure in our water supply, but when we look at the timing and the pace of growth, we need to make sure that we understand when we need that capacity um, expansion online. And then, of course, raw water infrastructure. Um, this is something we looked at how to deliver water from the treatment plant out to our users, and, and we know that our raw water infrastructure is also key assets that we need to look at in the future. So in the next slide, I wanted to summarize some key takeaways. And um, overall, um, some improvements that were identified um, are central around maintaining fire flow. There's some specific developments and, and improvement projects that we um, identified the need to make some improvements to make sure we can serve that fire flow. We have some recommendations around treated water storage in the future, and we paired that with an opportunity to replace an aging tank at the water treatment plant so we could both achieve the expansion that we need, um, but do it in a way that also allows us to maintain our existing assets. And then we have some recommendations around our water system replacement program, and we'll speak to this where we want to continue to remain proactive and even increase our replacement program efforts. So as I mentioned, things that we didn't cover yet um, that we want to look at next are raw water supply assets and analysis around that. Um, and then continuing to update our hydraulic model and run scenario analysis to really um, tune in to the pace of planned growth. So in the next slide, I just wanted to show you an example of why these next steps are important. And um, you heard Sharon tell some stories around last summer and what that means around peak day and max day. Well, here's some production trends. And on the first figure to your left upper part of the slide, we're just showing an annual average day over the last five years. And you start to see that on an annual average basis, we are seeing that planned growth and um, increasing demands. But the way that annual average day translates to to max day is really through a peaking factor. And you start to see that when we translate the need to achieve that peak day demand, we're also seeing um, an increase in the max day. And what's plotted to the right in that max day is a red line showing our current treatment capacity of 52 MGD and the fact that we're over 40 MGD now with um, maintaining a max day in 2020. So the way that relates is we're nearing that 80% mark of our current treatment capacity. And that's the time to start looking at this and asking these questions as we are today, as we program out the improvements needed and the timing of those improvements to make sure that we're ahead of that, um, we're, we're, we're planning and we're addressing those, those future needs. So in the next slide, um, I just wanted to tune in on how we're using our water model to assess some um, scenario analysis. Well, we already heard the story around operational challenges. And this slide just depicts our um, overall system. And in the upper northwest quadrant is where we're starting to see some increased demands. And in the next slide, if we go to that, I want to just talk a little bit about what we're doing to assess this. Um, in the example that Sharon mentioned earlier, we had, um, we had an experience during high summer peak day demand where we were really running our pump stations around the clock. And what's shown on this figure um, in the gray and in the orange trends 
um, relate to our pump station flow. So those were, were running around the clock on. And then in the blue trend, you start to see the ransom tank level. And we typically monitor our tank levels and operator systems to maintain within this operational level. But, you know, as we think about balancing our level of service objectives, we want to always make sure we're ability to serve our standby and our fire flow capacity out of our storage tanks. And what, what was happening in this example was that we wanted to remain above that low tank alarm. And so our pumps are running around the clock around there. Um, outside of their design range. Um, and so that that's what really motivated some of this additional work for us to look closely at um, our infrastructure, its current capacity and how we're operating it. So in the next slide, it just shows an, a draft schematic that we're working on with another consultant we have on board. Our Murray Smith team is helping us take that next step from the master plan. So I mentioned running additional scenario analysis um, related to using that hydraulic model. We're continuing to calibrate it to make sure it matches with our system operations today. And we're dialing in um, opportunities to optimize those operations so that we can um, better serve those peak demands that we're experiencing. And then what we're hoping to do is really also figure out um, you know, the timing of those future improvements and when it's critical to have those assets online. So those additional, that additional pump station capacity or that new storage tank, we wanna make sure we need to understand exactly when that needs to come online timed with our planned growth. So with that, Sharon, I think maybe it's a good point to, to pause, take any other questions or, or kick it back over to you to talk about themes. Thank you, Jacqueline. So a, a comment on what you just heard Jacqueline talk about with the, the update to this, uh, this computer model of our distribution system. I just want to emphasize that in the, in the master planning work we've done over the last two years, um, that's the first time Arvada has really used that level of innovation and sophistication and modeling, and it's really exciting. Um, and being able to report on, on, on our assessment of just between what happened this summer and being able to model it in, in our computer system now puts us on a whole different level in terms of um, understanding design capacity and, um, and, uh, and, and our operational conditions. Um, so thanks, Jacqueline, for that. Um, so back to the themes of the findings. You've heard about aging infrastructure. You've heard about some capacity limitations we have. Um, let's um, let's uh, jump through the next couple slides quickly because I know you want to get to the handout. Uh, so next slide, please. All right, here's our assessment. Next slide, please. Yeah, okay, so back to the why. What I didn't tell you earlier is that little boy in the top that's my son, Ian, and he's a first grader, and he is a uh, Arvada native, and um, he loves to drink ice cold water. <laughs> so that's part of why we're doing all this, guys, is for our families and for the future families of the city. Um, next slide. Um, I also wanted to take a minute and recap that briefing we did provide to you ahead of this, um, this conversation on the um, November 20th. This, um, this is a, probably a good little reminder of some of the topics that came up before we jump to the handout. Um, one is uh, just now is the time for us to be focusing on water infrastructure. It's good timing, not only because it's a deadline in our strategic plan, uh, it's good timing because of some of the condition assessment findings. It's a good timing because we really do wanna make sure that we are pacing our uh, projects um, in line with the expectations of our, um, our partners in plan development. And again, last summer with the hot, dry weather and, um, and just the pace of development we're seeing, we, we got out of sync with that a little bit. Um, so we are updating the engineering, as Jacqueline described, um, and really focusing on what we can be certain we can provide in the very short term in terms of, of, of capacity. Um, we're doing that on the water side, but also on the wastewater side. So you're going to hear more about this here in the next couple months um, as we as we fine tune our forecasting and projections. Um, there's also a piece we haven't talked about tonight, but it's very important part of our suite of of, of tools, and that is water conservation. Um, 
there's a team uh, here at the city that that participated in the Sonoran Institute's Growing Water Smart uh, workshops this year. And there's a lot of innovation around water conservation and ideas on engaging the community. I understand that the um, Arvada Sustainability Committee is also um, interested in, in, in taking a look at that and providing support for. And then, as I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we will have future conversations about the financial strategy. We started to, um, to run some preliminary models, nothing that we're ready to present tonight, but, um, but we will be returning to you in uh, early 2021 with some more details on that. Um, so let's, uh, let's pull out the handout. Next slide, please. So you obviously can't read this on the screen. It's, um, it's, it's our attempt to uh, distill all of this work and all of this thought process into a one pager um, that we could all refer to. Um, so a couple highlights from this. Um, we have in here the 10 year CIP model represented. Um, and based on current funding levels, we have funded about 221 million. That includes the contribution of uh, budgeted 117 million for the Denver Water Gross Reservoir expansion. And what we have determined are unfunded, but recommended from the master plan, a total of about $185 million worth of projects. And a large part of that is part of what Chad talked about, which is the need to either make major renovations to the Arvada plant or do a full replacement. Um, so of the unfunded amount, we do have um, a significant portion of that is related to the, um, the, 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 the water treatment plant needs. Um, overall, the split as we've calculated it is about 58% of these projects are capacity related. And I wanna note that that's, that's a different number than you heard me say in the budget presentation earlier this year. And the reason for that is we decided to, to account for the gross reservoir expansion as fully capacity related. So when I had said earlier, we thought that um, we estimated that about 30% of the projects were capacity related dollar wise. Um, Considering gross reservoirs expansion, it changes that ratio. Um, a couple of other uh, comments I wanna make on this handout. Um, one is that you'll see there's a lot that is programmed just here in the next two years. Um, and if you look at closely at the numbers that are in red, those, especially those unfunded projects are projects that we're looking to reallocate some of our fund balance to because they reflect immediate needs that are directly impacting our treatment processes. Um, so examples for that are our um, residuals handling project. We're about at capacity for being able to manage the sludge out of our treatment plants. And the last thing you wanna do is, is have your, your the tail wagging the dog at your treatment plant that you've got a certain amount of residual limitations that you can produce. So that's driving water quality decisions. You really want water quality decisions to be driving that. So that's a, about two and a half million we need, uh, we need to invest here in the next couple of years. There's also some facilities with structural problems. An example is our clarifier tanks out at the Arvada water treatment plant. Um, we've got some chemical system reinvestment needs we need to do. Um, and then there's a certain amount that's associated with the um, raw water pump station we need to do here in the short term um, in anticipation of next year's outage of the Ralston Reservoir that Denver Water has planned. Before, before you move on, Mr. Marriott's got a question. Yes. Thank you, Your Honor. Sharon, I just have a question um, about what you said a minute ago about, uh, you know, of this, of this sheet. 58% is kind of designated as capacity expansion and 42% reinvestment. How do those numbers line up with the source of the, of the money both that's been that's been placed in reserves so far, not reserves, but that that's on hand so far, and that's anticipated to come in in the coming couple of years. Does that line right. up about the same? And I guess I would preface that with my understanding is is that 
um, tap fees and developer fees is, is all about capacity and rates, water rates are all about uh, uh, maintenance improvements, you know, that, that type of stuff. That, that's exactly right. Um, I don't. Ha I haven't done the the full count, but um, looking at what the funded and unfunded projects are, um, I, you know, I'm I'm estimating we are around 150 to 200 million in um, funded, currently funded in the 10-year CIP, um, and that's certainly a number we can fine tune and get back to you on. Um, we do not have the full 236 million funded in the current CIP. Yeah, um, I, I guess I might have. I, let me ask my question again. I'm sorry, I, I didn't a ask it clearly. But if if about 58 percent of of these um, these these expenses that we're gonna we're gonna potentially do over time um, are revolve around capacity is the money that's both here now and that will come over this same period of time is about 58 percent of that money coming from s sources of funds that would be dedicated towards capacity so in other words tap fees and developer fees that that kind of thing that that is that is exactly why we um we we started to uh to tease out the the projects in this way because that that is exactly the philosophical approach we want to take as we're going forward with our financial plan to implement. That is that of the total, that 236 million would need to come from tap fees and or some kind of developer contribution. Another way to look at it, and, and I will put my longtime resident hat on, um, having been here a lot, 15 years or so, is that what we're not asking is for our current rate payers to fund that expansion. Right. So the expectation is that growth pays for itself and that that 236 million would need to be revenue coming in from sources associated with the new planned development. Um, we do have a good fund balance. Um, we, we, so let me just make a comment on that. We've got a hundred million dollars Brian Archer can correct me on that if I have it totally wrong, but that's about right. In terms of um, funds that we have received from top fees over the last 10 years, and we have banked them in anticipation of needing to make this major investment in gross reservoir. So it's not like we're sitting here today saying we need to come up with 236 million going forward because we, we have quite a bit in reserves. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Ms. Ford, do you have any questions? I'm good, Mayor. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I want to I want to talk on the next slide. Next slide, please. Um, we did an exercise trying to prioritize this long list of projects, and we we really struggled. And um, and so this is part of the story. I think it's important to hear too. We've done a great job over the last 20 years of keeping up with certain reinvestment and getting our water supply buttoned up. What that has done though, is it's put us in a position here where we have a lot of projects that are both important and urgent in the short term. We really tried to look through this whole list of projects and, and use a quadrant analysis and, and, and tease out, okay, which are the ones that can wait a little while, which are the ones that have a lower risk of, you know, some kind of failure to our, um, to our system. And you can see here, we really, we, almost all of them are in that do category. Um, and, and, and to no small extent too, speaking to what you heard Chad say earlier, which is some of these things take many years from the time you decide to start to the time you actually complete construction. So if we decided today to build a new water treatment plant, it's very likely we would be looking at 2028 to actually turn it on. So um, so I wanted to share this with you because this is in no way a reflection on us sort of being behind, but it certainly is a call to action and it certainly reflects a certain urgency that, that we feel for um, especially some of these immediate projects that need to get done. 
Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, I just have a few more slides to go. I know you guys have had a long day. Um, so here's, here's painting a timeline forward. Um, starting here in the 2020s, we need to do some water system expansion and reinvestment now. We need to do some work on those Ralston plant filters. We need to get the residuals handling upgraded and upsized. We need to make some important decisions on the Arvada plant, whether we're going to try and, um, and uh, repurpose them of what we've got, or are we going to build new? Um, we also have a storage tank on Highway 93 that, um, that needs to be built. That's our also called our Sleeping Indian Tank that's been in the works for a couple few years now, and um, we're frankly just behind on it. Um, and so it's time for us to, to accelerate that project. Um, we've got the Canyon Pines development that is west of Highway 93 that has come in with some detailed infrastructure design, and we'll be working with them to get that pump station and tank built. And then there's one more piece that, um, that, that we're looking to fund here in the next decade, and that is around our distribution line replacement frequency. Um, there, and you'll see this, uh, you'll see two lines on this in the, in the handout. One is called uh, under the funded project, um, water system replacement operations program at 1%. And then you'll see it under unfunded at 2%. And this is important because we've got a great history of not having uh, uh, line, line breaks um, have major impacts on our system. Um, but my concern and the concern of the team is that at the 1% rate, which we're currently funded, it assumes that water lines last 100 years. And we know from um, industry standards and experience that it's more prudent to plan for them to only last about 50 years, which means that we need to, we need to prioritize approximately doubling our reinvestment so we can get to a 2% per year level. So that's the next 10 years. And, um, and now's the time to start moving forward with those. And then, um, um, and then it's hard to believe we're talking about 2030s, but we are. And that's when we're starting to approach build out. And there will be an update of the comprehensive plan here in the next year or two. We're gonna be folding all of this work into that discussion, um, but we're looking at a 2040 build out date in many of our projections. And so um, the 2030s are when we need to make sure all that capacity is in place. It's kept pace with our planned re uh, development. And we are continuing that focus on our ongoing reinvestment. So uh, I think, next slide, please. Okay, Josie, you can go to the next one. So um, we're about ready to wrap up on implementation and next steps. Um, 2020 is gonna be a absolutely critical year for us. Um, and uh, we've, got, we've got multiple CIP projects programmed and funded. We've got multiple development program uh, projects coming in, almost like airplanes waiting to land. Like we can see them in the distance. We we're starting to quantify those impacts, and we we're working closely to make sure that um, when when they're ready to build and 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 have people move in, that we're ready to serve. I mentioned we also have a Ralston Reservoir outage that's planned outage. Denver Water needs to do some work on their reservoir, but that's requiring us to do some different types of operations this year and also finish our raw water pump station. Um, we're doing some of these uh, capacity assessments associated with the hydraulic model that Jacqueline talked about, just to make sure that in the very short term, we don't repeat what happened last summer with overburdening one of our pump stations. And then, um, and then hand in hand with this is our wastewater master plan. And again, we're not talking about that tonight, but it certainly overlaps a lot of the same areas. So, uh, man, we are just rocking and rolling in 2021. I'm excited. We've got a great team. We've got um, a great consultants. I mean, we have a ton of interest from fantastic consultants that want to help us with this. But we are, you're going to see a lot of activity from us in the year ahead. Um, so next slide, please. Um, so this is, this is what we're working on. We're working on capacity. We're working on you know, creative problem solving around our treatment plants. We're working on reinvestment. 
um, all all of these um, all of these components add up to our ability to to be able to turn that water on at the tap and have it safe and and tasty when when we need it. So um, for uh, for final comments, um, I'm going to now hand it back to Mr. Devin, and um, he is going to speak to our, our last formal slide of the evening and, and make some final remarks. And then at the conclusion, I'm ha happy to have, we've got a whole team of people here who can, um, who can answer any questions you may have. Um, but next slide, please, and I'll hand it to Mark. Thank you, Sharon. So what we wanted to leave the council with in terms of final comments, um, and then obviously we certainly want to answer any questions you may have, is that as, as we look back on the last 10 or so years, uh, we've supplied, we have secured our, our water supply for the city's future. That was a huge achievement. I don't think there's very many cities that can say, uh, certainly along the front range, uh, that we have secured the water supply for our plan build, uh, build out. Uh, which um, it was, was quite an achievement and goes back to uh, our forefathers and what they negotiated back many years ago uh, with Denver Water and how we've been able to add other um, water sources to our portfolio uh, to help us uh, in this regard. It, I want, it's, it's very important for me to make sure that the city council understands that we're following your strategic direction. We talked about a lot of projects tonight, a lot of these projects which cost a significant amount of money for, in terms of both reinvestment uh, as well as uh, handling the planned growth that we have um, uh, contemplated over, over many years. Uh, but part of our uh, responsibility as set forth in the strategic plan is a principle that says we're going to accomplish uh, the uh, maintenance and operation of our water utility system uh, at the lowest practical rates. So we need to continue to look at how we're going to fund these projects, uh, but we have to also be mindful of rates. And that's something that you all have been very clear about as we've brought rates before you in the past. Uh, that's why we've ended up somewhere in about the lower third of our uh, water um, uh, of other water supply uh, utilities uh, within the metro area, and we're proud of that. It's, we've been able to do so, uh, maintain a competitiveness from a pricing standpoint, and still offer a very dependable uh, water utility system. And then finally, uh, that means that we will need to be returning uh, with financial and operation strategy for how we're going to implement this. Um, again, we're going to be getting some feedback from you tonight, uh, but uh, we know that uh, uh, we need to come back and have another conversation about how we're going to accomplish all this, still keep our rates as low as possible, but make sure that we maintain the reinvestment in our existing water system as well as dealing with the uh, planned growth. So that would be the next step uh, following uh, tonight's workshop. And that's all I have. We're certainly open to, as Sharon said, taking any questions from the City Council. Ms. Ford, do you have any questions at this time? I do not, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Pfeiffer. So one thing I did not hear tonight was, if I recall in October, you presented if Denver water uh, rates did not go up that you wanted to keep the extra money to do some of these projects. Um, maybe you can give us a status on that. And then um, I'll ask my next question after that. Well, yeah, so what, what's the status of Denver rates going up or not, and then were we keeping the money? I my, don't recall, so I my, need your help yeah. refreshing my memory. My understanding the Denver rates are not going up. Right. Um, and then as far as the projects, uh, Sharon or one of the other team members, do you want to answer that, that question, please? Yeah, could you just tell us, remind us how much money that is, and then what I recall was in December we were going to have a workshop to discuss the, where that money would be um, used. Doesn't sound like we're going to have that tonight, but. So um, thank you, Council Member Pfeiffer. So if you want to look to the handout, the um, then under the unfunded project list, where we have the numbers listed in red, those are projects that we're moving forward with in part with the additional contributions from the um, rate increase. So I'm, 
I don't so, have the number off the top of my so head. What, I want to say it was about four hundred thousand dollars of well, that um, capital cost, and then the other, the rest of the um, the projects with the budget co colored in red, that is coming from fund balance. They're all so, in red. Oh, go ahead. They're all in red. Maybe I'm missing this. Help me through it. Okay. Because I see in the so, numbers on the sheet, there's probably uh, on the unfunded side, there's probably close to $5 million in red. That's right. So in, in what, what's called the existing um, is dollars that we're borrowing against the fund balance. Um, so those include projects like um, our updated hydraulic model um, updating the residuals handling for the water treatment plant and updating some of the chemical systems and SCADA that we need to do for um, for the Ralston plant. So then looking in 2021, we're continuing work on the residuals handling. Um, we are starting to do the work that requ that's required associated with that concrete repair we saw some pictures of, 250,000. Um, and then also there's some immediate repair we need to do for 600,000 from the Arvada water treatment plant. Um, and then there's continuing work on our uh, Ralston uh, filters. So, so, so can I can I ask a question a little bit differently because I, I don't know if, yeah. uh, how much money was that out of, I can't remember off the top of my head because I could not find the uh, presentation, but how much money did we allocate towards your projects for Denver water not being increased? How much money was that anticipated to be? I, I can look that up for you if you'll give me a moment. Because we were curious. I think the question we had in council in October was how that money would go to what projects, exactly what projects, not, not just the pool of projects, but I thought there was going to be some discussion around um, that money and uh, where that money would be applied to so we could have that discussion because remember part of the the problem is is we approved something without knowing what it was for right and now I want to so, know what it was for and I was told to wait till December and I'm that's where we are today so so council member Pfeiffer I, I just pulled up our presentation um, on the rates that you were referring to and it was four hundred and forty eight thousand dollars that we had originally set aside for the Denver water rate increase. Okay. And because the rate was not increased, we were able to reallocate that to our capital improvement fund and be able to support some of the projects that are here. Um, it's difficult, frankly, to point to any one particular project um, because all of the ones that are in red are ones that we decided could not wait any longer. Um, so I, I can understand that that may feel like an unsatisfying answer, um, but there are, there are no projects that are listed in red that that we can't. So if you didn't to if you didn't do. have that money, if we did not approve that money, what would have not happened on this list? How's that? So if we had not approved that money, we would have been forced to borrow further against our fund balance. Okay. And essentially what that does for us is that by borrowing anything against our fund balance, we're basically drawing off that reserve that we have in place for a gross reservoir. And so the decision and the recommendation, and I, I'm, I appreciate council support on it at the time, um, it does a couple things. First, it helps smooth our rate increases um, so that we're not we're not jumping too much in any one year. Um, but the other piece of this is 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 frankly a, a reality that we've got some immediate expenses that we would have to either cover from borrowing against the fund balance or um, in this case, get a little bit of it from a moderate increase in rates. So, so borrowing against the fund balance for gross reservoir, um, I'm assuming you will have that fully repaid when those bills come in. I mean, they could come in. I don't, I don't know what the status is of gross right now, but let's just say they start tomorrow. I mean, they're going to start asking for money. Well, 
and now we, we borrowed we against believe, them? We believe that with the um, schedule, current schedule for gross reservoir, we can move those payments out, the first and second payments that we have scheduled at least two years. Okay. And isn't that some, some of that money in escrow, I thought? Yes. Okay. So we're not borrowing against the escrow, no. obviously. We're borrowing against other funds that go into that. Okay. Basically our capital funds. Okay. And all right. So we, you got that covered. I mean, this kind of gets into my question about why not use the reserves. I mean, if it's so dying... It, well, I know we have philosophical differences here, but if these are in red, means danger, Mr. Robinson, then we should probably be yes. pulling out so of... In, in effect, reserve. that's what we're doing. We're doing exactly what you just said. Okay. We're just simply moving out. We're, we're, we're borrowing again. We're using the reserves, if you will, and, and funding that by moving out the payments for gross reservoir based on the schedule that Denver Water to, is projecting. To replenish the reserves. Right. Okay, got right. it. Okay. And then uh, the question I have is, so, you know, here in your, in your treatment discussion about Arvada uh, Waste Treatment Plant, I think that's what AWTP is, right? Or Arvada Water Treatment Plant, not waste. It would be regular water, right? Got right. it. Because we're not talking about waste tonight. Um, you, you have a couple different plans around that. I, I just was curious, $600,000 being uh, allocated to it, is that what I'd quote, you know, is throw away money because some of your plans talk about, you know, gut and replace or rearranging. And I just curious if we're putting this investment, it, it, what does it buy us if we're going to do something different there at that facility? Are, uh, Council member Fife, are you referring to the line in the handout that's in? Oh, that's uh, unfunded. $600,000. Yeah, that's unfunded. 600,000 unfunded. Right. It, it says so, clarifier too. It's, um, yeah, that's a great question and certainly something we are very tuned into. Um, and that is we don't want to spend money on anything that is just going to get need to get redone in a couple of years. Um, in fact, I'll give a shout out to Brad Wyant tonight. He's our water treatment plant supervisor manager and um, he reminds us of that all the time. I can tell you that the $600,000 gets us started on both plants. Um, both plants are looking to be expanded. Um, the Ralston plant, we're hopeful that we can get a lot of additional capacity in the same footprints by just doing some work on re when we rebuild those filters. Um, if you think about the, the sort of, there's a certain amount of water per square foot you can push through a, a, a filter bed. We redesign it and, and I, that's part of where these funds will go. Um, then we can guarantee some additional um, treatment capacity just with our existing infrastructure. And that's, that's almost like low hanging fruit. Um, it also, it needs to be part of that um, initial investment on planning and beginning to get um, work with CDPHE done so that we can in the out years be prepared for the actual construction. So there's quite a bit of this upfront um, study and design work that that needs to be done that that will not be you know money wasted it'll be money that we will be investing in right now um, that will directly affect our, our our ability to add capacity and and I'll ask if, if Jacqueline or Brad have anything to add to that or not Brad Chad Jacqueline or Chad no, I think you, you covered it, Sharon. Our goal is to really come up with a thoughtful, phased approach, and part of that does require some of this upfront planning. So whether it be kicking off the siting study as, as one of the alternatives to rebuilding the facility, um, as well as coming up with that comprehensive cost model so that we avoid um, having to replace assets that we've just improved. So that, that's part of what that work includes and we need to start that work now so that we're set up to do whatever pilot testing and, and preliminary design efforts to keep us on, on track. Okay, sorry, I have several questions. I was reminded, I say a question because I have several questions. <laughs> um, you still okay. have the floor. Uh, thank you, sir. I'll try, to, I'll try to wrap it up here soon because that was a long presentation. Um, if uh, so, the capacity issue out west, since a few of us live that way, um, get a little worried about uh, you know the developer was supposed to pay its way, developer is supposed to pay for the you know I don't know if you would say capacity, but you know they're supposed to to pay for that. I'm a little worried. A uh, couple things. One is 
you know, where did we fall short there? Shouldn't, shouldn't have the developer, other than the most recent zoning we changed uh, up by Candelas, it should have been all planned for for those those number of uh, buildings. And then um, secondly, with your data, the other concern I have, and I didn't hear it anywhere in your presentation, but I think your higher water usage is because people were home more, um, using toilets and showering maybe more frequently, who knows, watering their grass, being bored and watering their trees. And I, I, so you, nowhere in there did you say anything about, you know, people are just home using their facilities more frequently. Uh, I, I would assume that that would be some influence in that number and that would be an abnormal uh, you know, data point maybe for this one summer uh, to base uh, capacity growth off of. So I'd, I'd put a little grain of salt on that. So I had two questions blended in there. I was trying to combine it. So I let my council members take the floor from here. Thank you. Um, and, um, and I know, I know that it's getting late. We, we love to geek out about this stuff and are happy to do it anytime. Um, the, uh, let me speak to both your questions, council member Pfeiffer. Um, one is plan for infrastructure capacity. So I want to be clear that we're talking about that uh, capacity to serve the very peak demand when everybody's got their sprinklers on um, and maybe they're washing clothes and 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 it, it's it's when in the in the graph Jacqueline showed it's when the tanks really start to draw down. The, the pump stations are running and the tanks are still dropping. Um, and it's those peaks that are uh, the areas of concern for us. So as far as the, um, as far as your comments on the developer needing to do their, their job in designing and, um, and constructing a sufficient amount of infrastructure for their system, um, this is the first time that we've seen any indication that, that we're having trouble with those peaks. Um, if I, if I could characterize the current work we're doing, like right, like currently now this month, um, it is to try and understand how perhaps the, um, the control systems of these are set so that one, when one pumps to another, pumps to another, pumps to another, that whole system is optimized. Um, I, I think a little bit of our history has been to approve one project at a time and now we really are, are, are starting to hit some challenges because approving it one piece at a time isn't really the full analysis of the whole system as it can work next. So we've got one tank and pump station pumping to another pump station, pumping to another pump station. And, um, and that work just, it, it, it hasn't been done, um, but it's being done now. Um, and we are, we're looking closely at what the reality of our current situation is in terms of meeting those peak demands. As far as higher usage, when it comes to the, um, the, the new reality we're in, we are seeing some interesting trends um, in water usage uh, associated with folks being home all day. So typically before COVID, we would see two peaks during the day. We'd see one in the morning when everybody gets up and takes their showers, maybe does a load of laundry. And then another one in the evening when folks are back home again, cooking, um, laundry and maybe turning on their sprinkler. So you would see actually two major peaks. Um, and so to some extent, we're seeing some of that level out a bit. Um, and so the overall demand, I think you're right, Council Member Pfeiffer, it's associated with, um, with just those changing um, water usages uh, from people being at home. Um, but we're still, the, the system's most challenged on, the, on those peak days and those peak hours. So if everybody's you know, running their sprinklers all at the same time, that's where our system is stressed more than it is just from a, a, a higher usage. Um, but you make a great point, and that's certainly something that we're looking at um, closely as we, as Jacqueline mentioned, we're hitting the 80% threshold now in our water treatment plant. Um, what does that do to um, some of our other assumptions? No, thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it very much. I ran out of tokens, so I'll Give the floor back to the mayor. Thank you. A question I've got is that, um, you know, we're talking about storage capacity and, and one of the issues is raw water storage capacity. And years ago, we acquired the XL Energy underground gas storage facility 
are we using that? Did that turn out to be a bust? Is it, is it something, I'm seeing a smile, so I'm kind of curious as if I could get some information on that. I, I can give you some information. Um, I, I'm smiling because, in fact, we just were out there um, as a team about two weeks ago, um, visiting the site, um, assessing the condition. We, we were accompanied by a member of the state's mine, Division of Mining Safety team, because um, they're, they're trying to get their arms around what all is out there now. Um, so one of our next steps in order to really get a good answer to your question will be to, um, to do some pumping from the wellhead that exists out there. We haven't done that in a long time. Um, and once we get that moving, we will have a much better understanding of, of what, how, to what extent that's an option for us for, for storage. Um, I, I'm still personally optimistic based on all of the previous studies. Um, where I'm hesitating is that we just, we haven't challenged that system in a number of years now. And, um, and we, we're starting to put in place a plan to do that. Yeah, I'm trying to even remember when we acquired it. Was it before you, Mr. Pfeiffer? Or? So it's been... I remember we talked even about, hey, that water could even be pure down there. It's at Sir Cole, right? It's a coal mine. Mm -hmm. um, and then it kind of got quiet, but you know, it was... Yeah, I'm, I'm, so if, so if we could get an update on that, that would be beneficial. My big complaint at the time was that it was really hard to water ski down there, but other than that, it was a, <laughs> it had some interesting potential for us in terms of... You know, I, I, I'm not aware of, of any recommendations for recreational use of that storage. <laughs> Um, well, the mayor, that is an interesting The mayor said he'd idea. go down and do scuba diving to check it all out if yeah. he needed to. <laughs> Thanks, but you know, I, I may be a certified diver, but I'm not certified crazy, so I'm not going to do it. No Petticoat well, Junction there, Mayor? Yeah. So let's get some information on that just so that we know if that's an asset that has got Absolutely. any potential use for us. Our, our water rights, I can say with certainty, our water rights are found. And so as far as storage um, and, and uh, well capacity from the state engineer's office, we're in great shape. So when I mentioned needing to drop a, a pump in there and start pumping, it's just as a practical matter, how's it gonna function for us? And we've got some work to do there. So happy to circle back and provide you some more details. Very good. Uh, Ms. Ford, do you have any follow-up questions? I don't. I want to thank the water department for their presentation. You, you folks do a great job. And, uh, you know, it, I, I feel very secure in your thinking. Uh, so I appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you. I see no other questions up here on the dais. Mr. Devin, anything else you need from us at this point? No, Mr. Mayor, um, as, as is often the case when we present these very complex kinds of projects, uh, Councilmember Pfeiffer jumps ahead with asking some very detailed questions, which we promise we will bring back the next time uh, we have a discussion about this. This was a lot of information to go through, uh, and um, uh, we actually worked with this with this team up uh, that is appearing before you remotely for um, several weeks in putting this information together with the understanding that this is really kind of phase one and we have future phases uh, to discuss with you in particular, you know, the, the long-term financial strategy to make all this happen because it is necessary to make it happen uh, and still keep our rates as competitive as possible. Thank you, Mr. Devin. Do you have any other staff updates for no, us? No, we don't. Uh, this is the last workshop of the year. Um, and the last council meeting of the year will be returning um, on January 4th. Very good. I would wish everyone a happy holiday and safe travels or non travels, I suppose, would be more important <laughs> this go around. But uh, we'll see you shortly after the start of the new year. And let's hope that 2021 helps turn the corner. Thank you.